Heavenly Father, we thank you. We are able to come before you, and we know that you've been speaking to us, Lord, week after week, Sunday after Sunday. We walk under an open heaven because of the revelation from on high. Lord, we know that with revelation, we're able to come into the deeper things that you have prepared for us. You have such a great destiny for every single one. Every person represented here, every family represented here has a very powerful task, uh, destiny because of Jesus, because of your love for us. So speak once again from your word in Jesus' name and everybody say amen and amen. Now we are doing a series called The Power of Confession about the words that we say with our mouth. Now, this is possibly one of the most important series I could ever preach on a weekend because next to the law of love, the law of confession is the biggest thing at work in our lives. Whether we know it or not, next to the law of love, the most powerful thing is the law of confession. The words that we choose to live under will govern our lives. Now, God functions by words. Jesus functions by words. I'm going to talk more about that next week. Now, the, the truth is, He has designed you and I to operate and to function on this earth in this lifetime by our words. By our words. You see, you know, we live in a word-created, word-governed, word-root universe. Go with me in our Bibles right now to Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to see this. The first few verses, the first time God introduced Himself to us. He says in verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said. See, the first thing we see about God, He said something. Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Two verses down, verse 6, Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Three verses down, verse 9, Then God said. Verse 11, Then God said. Verse 14, Then God said. You read throughout the, the first chapter, verse 20, Verse 24, 26, 28, 29. Then God said, then God said, then God said, then God said. See, God didn't snap His finger and the earth came into being. God didn't wave His wand and there was light. Everything God did, God did it by speaking the word, by the spoken word, and everything was created. Whatever God wanted in this earth, He spoke it into existence. Nothing came into being until after He had said the word. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 give us a summary of the creation story. Hebrews 11 3 says, By faith, we understand that the worlds or the universe were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So the whole universe was framed by God's Word. His Word set the form, the structure, set the framework for everything that is visible and invisible. Everything was said by His Word. Now, Dr. Max Planck, the founder of quantum theory, Nobel Prize winner, he spent his entire lifetime studying the universe. And the more he studied, the more he's convinced God's alive, that God is real. So he came to believe in God and became a Christian. Now, Dr. Planck came to the conclusion that to be a scientist, you got to be a man of faith and a man of imagination. Now, Planck says, or said, that all physical matter composed of vibration. Every matter, form, uh, every energy source, every color, seen or unseen, are composed from vibration. And this is how the universe was created. You read it in the Bible. By words. Because words basically is the vibration of sound. In fact, the word universe actually 
came from two words, two Latin words, uni, which means one, and verse, which means a poetic word, a word of poetry. So how did the universe came about? God spoke a beautiful word, let there be light, and boom, 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 everything came about. Friends, words have tremendous power to create. Scientists say that the universe is expanding at the speed of light. Some say it's faster than the speed of light because God said it. The first thing he said, let there be light. And he never canceled what he said. And from that time until today, everything is expanding at the speed of light. You see, science and faith, they don't contradict each other. The more you look into science, the more you realize that the author of science is our living God. Somebody give God a big clap. Hallelujah. Amen. But what I want you to know is this. Once you make a confession, your word is so powerful, once it's spoken, it sets things in motion that cannot be stopped unless it's being canceled or being announced. Once you say it, things begin to happen. Now, God, after He created the universe, He then made men and women, you and I, after His own image. Adam was to operate in the same way. Now, go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That means to be like God in every way, in the way He functions, in the way He operates. God is spirit. You and I are created spirit being. God is sovereign. Man has free will, right? God is able to create. We are creative. God sees into the future. Man has the power of imagination. God sustains all things by the words or by the word of His power. Well, what about us? What about us? God created man to have dominion. Now, look at verse 26 again. God said, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God gave Adam and Eve, men and women, dominion. Everybody say dominion. Now, this word dominion means the right to command, the right to speak. So God gives us authority to be released, where? Through our mouth. Through our mouth. Jesus says, you have the right to command every mountain to be cast into the sea. And it will obey you if you believe in your heart. Now, this is confirmed in the Genesis account on the actual creation of man. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. So, chapter 1 is the summary. Chapter 2 is the actual event of the creation of man. It says in verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We became what? A living soul. So we became a living soul, right? That's why we always say we are soul winners. We got to win souls because we are living souls. Now, this word living soul in the ancient Greek Bible is translated speaking spirit. Man became a spirit that speaks. This is our distinctive characteristic. We have something that other creation don't have. We are able to release power and authority by the words of our mouth. Man became a speaking spirit. Now, parents can repeat things. Polly love a cracker, Polly love a cracker. Computers can print out words. <laughs> I love you, I love you, whatever. <laughs> but none of them can have a believing heart and speak the word of faith and can have dominion over the earth. But we can. Our calling, therefore, is to be the custodian of God's thoughts and God's words. When we think the way God thinks, we see the way God sees, 
and we speak it, things begin to happen. All throughout the Bible, we see God saying, Son of man, speak to the nations. Prophesy, son of man, to the four winds. Say my word to the people. Because he has given us the authority to decree his purpose into existence in this earth. You are given authority. Turn to your neighbors on your left and right and say, you have divine authority. <laughs> now, God needs us in that sense. Because he, in his sovereignty, he has given us the authority. And that is the reason why the Holy Spirit cannot go to the cross. You know, because God needed a man. That's why Jesus came. Now, God designed Adam such that everything he spoke came to pass. All Adam needed to do was to speak the word only and it will happen. Now, we were never designed to speak things that we don't expect to happen. You know, I mean, Adam doesn't walk around in the garden and say something and say, oops, it didn't work. <laughs> Everything he said actually happened. You see, we were designed to say what we mean and mean what we say. <laughs> because in the beginning, whatever we said will come to pass. God has made it this way so that our destiny will come out of our mouth and no one can stop us except we ourselves. You see, no one can stop us but us. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 12 and verse 37, For by your words, you'll be justified. That means you'll be set free. You'll be, you will overcome. You'll have victory. By your words, you'll be condemned. You'll be put in bondage. You will be beaten down. You'll be unable to rise up by your words, your own words, not by the devil, not by other people, but by your words. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. Church, this is not a philosopher speaking. It's, it's Jesus Christ. It's printed in red. He put all the emphasis on the words we speak because our words are the keys to unlock or lock our future. You, ha you can decide. Death and life are, in the, are not in the power of Satan. Death and life are not in the power of other people. Death and life are not in the power of the economy or the analysts. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Your tongue. My tongue. No one can control your destiny but you. Your future is not in other people's hands. Your future is in your mouth. So we are the sum total of whatever we've been saying. We are, whatever we speak accumulatively will determine what we'll get in our lives. So instead of speaking death, you must decide this week, today, right now, you're going to speak life because God created you this way, that whatever you say will happen for you. Now, what the devil has done is to convince mankind of two things. That number one, we are not created in the image of God. You know, we are not like God. Or, you know, there's no such thing as God. So they try to convince us that. Second thing is, the devil is trying to convince us whatever we say will not affect our lives. So joke all you want. Be flippant all you want. You know, and, and we become very careless. We become very loose with our words. And Jesus calls it, idle words you say one day you're going to be judged for every idle word that we say she's driving me crazy you know why do you need to say that you know you could say well she's not been nice to me she's driving me crazy i'm going insane because of you you know i'm going through hell right now are you are you really physically in hell i'm so miserable i'm depressed okay happy i'm depressed <laughs> Or typical Singaporean speak, die, die. This time, sure, die. We're all going to die. You really make me sick. I'm afraid I can't go. Why do you need to say that? If you can't go, just say you can't go. I'm, I'm afraid I can't go. The moment you say that, what is the devil doing? He's training your tongue. He's training you to speak death such that unconsciously, subconsciously, every single day, 
you are speaking death to your destiny. I'm afraid I can't go. You just confess you're afraid. So you give the devil the license to put fear in your life because you just confess that fear is part of your life. I'm afraid I can't go. Then you're wondering, why am I so fearful? Why don't I have confidence? People like me can never afford this. Why do you need to say that? Even if you don't have enough money right now, why do you, people like me will never be able to afford things like that. The moment you say that, it goes deep into your heart. And you are effectively sabotaging your own destiny because right now, the devil will set things in motion to make sure you don't succeed in your work, you don't succeed in your career, so that you'll never be able to afford anything. Your words is powerful. Oh, I'm just trying to be honest, Pastor. Well, you better think of another way to be honest. <laughs> you know, because whatever you say will determine your destiny. You see, you can decide whether is it death or life. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 2. You are snared by the words of your mouth. That means you are entrapped. You set a trap for yourself. You are taken by the words of your mouth. The word taken means you are bound. You are hindered. You are limited. Why set a limit on yourself? Why set a limit when your God, our God, has no limit on us? He says all things are possible. You see, sometimes we think we are being cute. Sometimes we think we are joking. We are just, oh, we are being honest. What really happens is that you and I become the sum total of everything that's coming out of our mouth. Turn to your neighbor one more time and say, learn to speak life. Amen. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, I want to show you some examples, okay? Genesis chapter 4, turn your Bibles with me. God was dealing with this man called Cain. Now, Cain did something really bad. What did Cain do? He was the first murderer in history. He murdered his brother. Who can tell me? Trivia. What's the name of Cain's brother? Abel. Cain just killed Abel. Cain, let's pick up the story right now. Genesis chapter 4, verse 11. So this is God speaking after Cain killed Abel. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. Now, God stop it right there. You're going to be a vagabond, and you shall be a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. But Cain was filled with so much anger and so much guilt. He was angry with God. He was angry with his brother. He was angry with his life. He felt his life suck. <laughs> He's so upset. He went further than what God said in his word. So in his own words, verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Now, who said that? God didn't say that it will happen that somebody will find you and kill you. But he just said to himself. And he said to God, it will happen once it is spoken. It became a matter of record. Once it is spoken, things are set in motion. The devil could come in now because you just gave Satan the license to have a foothold in your life. So verse 15, the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Can you see how loving and merciful God is? God is saying, look, you know, what you say, all right, I'm going to put protection on you. Anyone that touches you, I'm going to judge him seven times, and I'm going to put a mark. So everybody knows that, you know, they're they are not supposed to treat you anyhow. Now, here was a merciful God, but once Cain said it, he's, I'm going to get killed. There's nothing God could do, because God is sovereign. He's all-powerful but it's given your destiny in your mouth. Now, tradition say 
that Cain was later killed by his great-great-grandson Lamech. He was eventually killed. God didn't want it to happen, but he said it. It will happen. I will get killed. So he was murdered by one of his relatives. Don't confess what God has not said. Don't confess whatever God didn't say in his word. Let me show you another example. Rachel was Jacob's beautiful wife. You know, Jacob worked 14 years to, to, to win her hand in marriage. She was a very, very beautiful girl, right? And yet they had a very difficult relationship with Rachel's dad, Laban. So they've been trying to run away from Laban. Laban was a very controlling man, a very domineering father, and, and really not a very honest person. So they were trying to run away. Finally, they managed to escape. But on their way out, Rachel stole the idols of the father. Now, the Bible didn't tell us why she chose to steal it. Some people say she wanted to stop the idolatry in the family. Some people say because, well, uh, they were running away. The idols were made of gold. She was hoping to sell it so that they could start a family. Anyway, we, we don't know why. But Laban caught up with them, and he asked, Why did you steal my gods? Jacob didn't know. Rachel had taken it. So he spoke out loudly. That's Genesis 31, verse 32. Anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live. Now, Jacob didn't know. He said, anyone that has taken your idols, that person shall die. Now, words have power, especially when it's spoken out of the mouth of a righteous man. Remember what the Bible says in James? The effective fervent prayer of the righteous makes tremendous power available. This, when there's a righteous man speaking, there's power. So, he said, the person that's taken it, he or she shall die. Rachel never told him afterwards, it's me, honey, I took it. Because he could have canceled that curse. So what happened? She died soon after that. After the birth of the second child, Benjamin, guess how old was she? 39 years old. Very, very young age. At a time, if you read the Bible, it's at a time when people live a long, long life. She died at 39. Her life was cut short because of words that are spoken. Turn to your neighbor and say, never say things God didn't say. <laughs> yeah. Let me show you another example. Now we look at Jacob, right? Genesis 37. Jacob found out Joseph, his favorite boy, was missing. So you know the story. The, the brothers kidnapped Joseph to sell him off to the Egyptians. So they threw Joseph into a pit, and then they took his clothes, trying to trick the father into thinking that Joseph had died. Now, but, but even then, they didn't really say Joseph had died. So what happened? Look at verse 32, Genesis 37. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Do you know whether is it your son's tunic or not? Now, Jacob recognized it and said, It's my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Who told him that? Who told Jacob that a beast has come and eaten him up? He readily accepted the lie without even checking. We are even sending his man to investigate. Because let me tell you why. You know why? Joseph, Jacob himself didn't really believe the visions and dream of Joseph. Je Jacob himself didn't really believe the word of the Lord that was given to his favorite boy. So when he see Joseph missing, he said, it's finished, it's finished, he's gone, he's gone. He was so devastated. He started crying, weeping, beating his breast. I'm, I will die. I might as well just die. What's the point of living? I might as well just die. So look at verse 35. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, this is Jacob speaking, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning, thus his father wept for him. 
He just spoke the word, spoke death. What's the point of living? My life is so hard, I might as well just die like Joseph. From that day, something happened to him biologically. From that day, something happened to him physiologically. He started premature aging. He started becoming weaker and weaker, such that when, when Joseph later brought him to see Pharaoh, Pharaoh was shocked. Pharaoh said, how old are you? Because you look so old. And if you read the rest of, 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 of that scripture there, that is uh, uh, Genesis 47, he got to apologize, say, Pharaoh, I'm so sorry. My life is so hard. Life is, is, is so hard on me. He looked so old and he was so frail beyond his age. Shortly after that, Jacob died and he died way younger compared to his father Isaac and grandfather Abraham. What's that power? Words have tremendous power. And so you got to learn, you know, to, to revalue your words. You got to realize this. Satan cannot release anything on the earth. Satan cannot release anything in your life without your cooperation. To speak death into your situation. The devil is not that powerful. He cannot just come in any which way he likes. To, to disturb you unless you open a door for him to come in. That is why you got to revalue your words. Don't say things God has not said. Don't say things God has not put down in his word. Sometimes we joke, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words cannot kill me, cannot hurt me. You're wrong. Words will kill you. Words will destroy you. Words are the most powerful things on this earth. Your words. Therefore, our words must have value. Everybody say, my word got to have value. Every word that we speak got to be measured by this word, by this book. That is why I love the Bible so much. Everything we say got to be measured by what the Bible says. You don't want to say things God have not said. Did God say your life will end tragically? Do you say you'll die young? Did, did God say you'll die young and lonely? Did God say you'll be sickly and weak? Did God say all these things? That, that you, you are going to be a failure in life? Then don't say what you didn't say. Don't say what God didn't say. The enemy wants to shoot a bad thought into your mind every single day and get you to speak it, to say something that is not in the Bible. Something that is not in line with this word. Don't say it. Train your mouth to only speak things that build up, not tear you down. Proverbs 30 and verse 32. If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil, now devised evil means, in the original Hebrew means, you have thought something bad. You have considered something bad. So when you go through life, when and, and life can be challenging. I mean, it's, we live in a broken down world, right? Bad things do happen because we live in a broken down society, in a broken down life. But when bad things happen, boom, the devil wants to shoot a thought into your mind. Oh, you're not going to make it. It's over. It's over. You know, you're, you're going to fail. You're going to be sick. Look at the medical report, you will not survive. Statistically, what is the chance of people surviving? You're not going to make it. The moment there's a bad thought that the devil should, now you can't stop that, you can't control him. Boom, he shoots a bad thought in your mind. What the Bible say? Put your hand on your mouth. Don't say it. Just because you think of a bad thought doesn't mean you need to say it. <laughs> not every thought needs to be spoken. Don't say it. Put your hand on your mouth. Put your hand on your mouth. Just don't, sometimes people look at me and maybe I, and I learned, I, I told you last week, you know, I've learned this over the years. I, I may feel a little under the weather, 
I may look a little under the weather, but I don't have a full-blown flu yet. I don't have a full-blown sickness yet. Somebody comes and see me, nice person, I mean very uh, unaware of anything, just say, Pastor, are you okay? You look a little under the weather. Now, immediately, I got to make a decision. I have learned over the years, if I say, yeah, I'm feeling sick, I guarantee you, in the next few hours, boom, I have fever, I have full-blown flu. I start coughing. If I put my hand on my mouth, you look under the weather, no, actually, I'm still good. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm still good, which I am. I'm not lying, I'm being honest. I find I have the resistance to resist the sickness. I have the resistance to resist the flu. Learn to put your hand on your mouth. You know, one time my pastor, Dr. Yonggi Cho, was eating with a leading neurosurgeon in, in Seoul, Korea. And the neurosurgeon, this is a top, top professor, he said, Dr. Cho, let me tell you this. My team and I have been researching for many years, and we have discovered a breakthrough. Uh, uh, we have made a breakthrough discovery in the study of the human brain. We have found that the speech center of the brain controls the entire central nervous system of the human body. He said, we have spent years and millions of dollars, and this is what we have discovered. So during surgeries, our doctors will open up the head of the patients, and they will probe the brain. And we found when you probe certain parts, certain parts of the body will respond. You, you probe certain parts of the brain, the hand will move. You probe certain parts of the brain, the legs will move. But when we probe the speech center of the brain, the whole body moves. So we found that the speech center of the human brain has full dominion and control over the central nervous system of the body, such that right now when we want to do an operation, a head surgery, we will check the words of the patients. If the patient keeps speaking negative words, the chances of success in the surgery will be very low. So we will not operate anymore. Because the speech center affects the whole body. Dr. Cho heard that and he smiled and said, oh yeah, uh, I have known that for many, many years. <laughs> so this doctor was shocked. How did you know? Who told you this? Dr. James. He said, what? Which Dr. James? From which university? We, we spent so many years. How could this Dr. James know? Dr. James from the New Testament. Because the New Testament said the tongue is a powerful thing. that full control over your life. Come on, give God a big hand. Oh, you want to clap? Let's give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. Everybody say out loud. Say, my words are powerful. Turn to your neighbor in front and behind you and say, your words are powerful. Amen, amen. So what is the fight of faith? I mean, what is the fight of faith? The fight of faith is not really a, a fight against the devil. The fight of faith is really a fight over our words. Your words. Can you control yourself not to speak death? Do you know for a lot of people, it's very difficult. It is very difficult. Now, look at Mark 11 one more time. Last week, we did a big study on this. But I want you to see Mark 11 and verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Now, God has made himself synonymous with his word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1 verse 1. So to have faith in God means have faith in the Bible. Have faith in what the Bible teaches. Have faith in the word of God. Now, let's read verse 23 together. Everybody from the front to the back, let's all read together starting now. For assuredly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now notice, I highlighted all those pronouns for you. There is no God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in this instruction, right? This shows how much Jesus believes in you. Let me tell you this. 
you may not believe in yourself, but Jesus believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. Jesus believed nothing is impossible to you. You can believe the unbelievable and receive the impossible. How? By the words of your mouth. Now, verse 25. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. So when you see a mountain, wow, this mountain is so formidable. I guess, well, I've got to live in the mountain. Don't live in your mountain. I guess I've got to climb. The, don't be a mountain climber. Be a mountain dissolver. <laughs> Dissolve the mountain. Remove the mountain. You know, what is interesting is this. Jesus spoke to the fig tree. That's a living thing. Jesus spoke to the mountain, a non-living thing. You know what that means? No matter what your situation, whether is it living or non-living, just speak to it. Just speak to it. Just tell the thing to be removed in Jesus' name and be cast into the sea. And God is watching over His Word to perform it. So if I speak His words, God take it upon Himself to move that mountain because we are in this partnership together. So, speaking is my part. The Word is His part. If I speak His Word, He will move the mountain. Now, look over here, verse 23. And this is what I want to get at today, okay? So put on your seatbelts. This is my main point today. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, does not what? Come on, talk to me. Does not doubt in his heart. I can't hear you. Does not doubt in his heart. But believes those things he says will be done. He will. Not he might. He may. He will have whatever he says. So Jesus is telling us, he's teaching us this. Your mountain will obey you. Just don't doubt. Just don't doubt. That means don't consider the negative. Train yourself not to consider the negative. Now, of course, the fact that there's a mountain, there is a negative. But don't consider it. Don't keep meditating on it. Don't keep thinking about it again and again. Just boldly and publicly speak out the end result that you want. Declare the end from the beginning. You don't need to know every detail of the process. You got a cancer report. Everything is bad. Everything is bad. You're not a doctor. You don't know what, what are the procedures that needs to be done. If you know, praise God, you could be more intelligent in your prayer. But even if you don't know, just speak the end result. I'll be healed of the cancer in the name of Jesus. Just speak to it. Remember, living thing, non-living thing, it will move. But you mustn't doubt. You mustn't doubt. Remember Genesis chapter 1? God didn't say anything about the darkness. The darkness was there. He never mentioned it even once. All he said was, let there be light. And there was light. You only read about the darkness in the commentary of the scripture. What God declared, let there be light. He never even mentioned once the darkness. He didn't say, hey, hey, angels, look how dark. Wow, so dark. <laughs> well, this one, we really need to have a lot of prayer. So dark. God didn't even once mention it. He's not blind. But God doesn't mention it. He didn't mention it. God didn't talk about the problem. He only talked about the promise. Because you know why? When the pro promise comes, the problem disappears. Most of the time, we are too consumed by the problem. Of course, God knew the problem. Of course. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. That's why the Holy Spirit is there. But He wasn't consumed by it. God Himself didn't consider the negative. If you keep on saying you're sick, you're sick, you're sick, you're sick. You keep on saying you're poor, you're poor, you cannot afford. You know, you're poor, you're poor. You keep on saying 
that you know that you're hopeless, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. Your mountain will get bigger and bigger and bigger. It will. Your tongue will strip your whole body of your immunity system. Your tongue will strip your mind of the ability and the determination to focus and overcome the problem. So don't doubt. Don't consider the negative. Speak God's word into the problem. I tell you, why do we doubt? Why do we always consider negative? Because the greatest fear you and I have is that if I really believe in this book, if I really believe in the Bible, in the Word of God, what happens if it doesn't come true? And I tell you, this has been the number one temptation from the beginning of time because the first temptation was Satan introducing doubt to Eve. Did God really say that? Did God really say? Come on, Eve. Did he really mean that? Maybe you read it, but he really didn't mean Look, you really want to believe this. What if you set yourself so high and it doesn't happen? Boom, you'll crash. And you'll be so disappointed. Every single day, the devil throws thoughts like that into our minds. Did God really mean that? Are you setting yourself so high? So Eve, her trust began to wane. Now, let me tell you what Jesus says concerning doubt, okay? Luke chapter 16, here are the words of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, Moses is great, Paul is good, but Jesus, he's the Alpha and the Omega. That means he is the first word and the last word. So let's look at verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one titter of the law to fail. A titter is like a comma. It's the smallest text in the whole scripture. You know what Jesus is saying? If a single promise, a single word in the Bible would fail, the whole universe will disintegrate. <laughs> it is easier for the universe to disappear than for God's word not to come true. You know what that means? You can trust God in His word completely. It is impossible for God not to fulfill His promise. That means you can trust Him with your health. Listen, my brothers, my sisters, City Harvest Church, listen, you can trust Him with your money. You can trust Him with your marriage. You can trust Him with your future. You can trust God with your entire life. Somebody give God a big clap and a great shout. Oh, you want to clap? Please go ahead and give God a big clap. Just one or two more examples and I will end, okay? God wanted Abraham to do the impossible. To have a son when Sarah was way past childbearing years. Way past. Right? Abraham kept his faith strong. How many of you want to be stronger in your faith from, from today? Put up your hands, all right? Okay, you, he wanted to keep his faith strong. How do you keep your faith strong? By not doubting by not considering the negative. That's how you build your faith. You don't consider the negative. You train yourself not to focus on the negative. Look at Romans 4 and verse 19. And not being weak in faith, see, that's how he became strong in faith. So not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now notice what he's saying. Abraham did not consider the negative. God never considered the darkness. He only confessed the light. Look at verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. So he focused on the promises. And this is what you need to do. Whatever situation you're going through, in your life, in your marriage, in your business, in your career, in your ministry, you got to focus on the promises of God. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, 
but was strengthened in faith. Giving glory to God. Giving glory to God. Giving glory. God, I praise you. I worship you. I give you thanks. You see, praise is the language of faith. That means with his mouth, he confessed again and again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to be... Oh, you couldn't say thank you, Jesus. Jesus hasn't come yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. <laughs> thank you, Father. You know, I'm going to be, a, a, I'm going to be a, a man of faith, a father of many nations. My descendants will be as many as the sand on the seashore, as the stars in the sky. I will not be called Abraham. I'm Abraham, father of many nations. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you. Glory be to the Lord. See, he kept praising God. He kept speaking the word of God into his life, into his marriage, into the womb of Sarah until a baby was born. Because Abraham, can we all read verse 21? Let's all read together. Because Abraham was what? And being fully convinced that what he has promised, he was also able to perform. Come on, talk to me, talk to me. Who is able to perform it? I can't hear you. Gotta be louder. Who is able to perform it? God. Who has promised it? God. But who must believe? Me. Me, right? Who must believe? Me. Who must say it? Me. But who is able to perform it? God. Church, if God did it for Abraham, if God did it for David, if God did it for Jesus Christ, if God is able to perform for Peter, if God is able to perform for Paul, God is able to do it for you. Come on, go ahead and praise God. He's going to do it for you. Oh, come on, come on. You want to clap? Let's give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. One more time. Turn to your neighbor and say, God will do it for you. One last story, one last story, okay? Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4. And here's a woman. Now, this is not the widow woman. We always talk about kings and we think of the widow woman. This is a woman with a husband. There was a woman who cannot have a child in 2 Kings chapter 4. Then the, the, the man of God, the prophet of God, Elisha, he prophesied. You're going to have a child. Boom, true enough, she got a son. Okay, she got a son. So let's look at the story here. 2 Kings 4 and verse 18. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father and to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to the servant, carry him to his mother. Now this boy had meningitis. Young boy fever his head was in tremendous pain and look at verse 20 when he had taken him and brought him to his mother he sat on her knees till noon and then died so this little miracle boy he hardly even grew out of his childhood got meningitis and died now obviously if god did a miracle to bring forth a child and then suddenly he died. You know it's a demonic attack. So what's so special about this boy? You know who this boy, his name is? His name was Habakkuk. He would grow up to be the great prophet. So when God has a plan, the devil has a plot. So here was this boy. He died. God doesn't play games with us. You know, he doesn't bless us with something. And then a short while, take it away. Pull the rug under your carpet and go, na, 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 na. God doesn't do that. Everybody, uh, let's be clear. God is a wonderful father. Amen. Yeah, look at verse 21. So she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Now, Elisha had a room in their house. So the mother took this little boy who had grown up to be Habakkuk the prophet Put him on the bed. Because in those days, you know, the anointing goes with the man because the Holy Spirit was yet to be poured on all flesh. So he, she put it on the bed. Now, look over here, verse 22. Then she called to her husband and said, Please, send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys. Quick, quick, quick. 
that may run to the man of God and come back. That means, I want to go and see Elisha. And the husband said this, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. Now, the husband was so spiritually dull and so spiritually ignorant. She and he, husband and wife, they needed a miracle at that moment. And he's wondering, why do you need to go and see pastor? Today is not Sunday, right? I mean, are we having a conference? Is this Emerge Asia Conference? What are you going to see, Pastor, for what? Hello? We need a miracle. You need the man of God to pray. So, the husband said, what do you need to do that? Now, notice what she said to the husband. Now, the boy had died. The husband is outside the room. The husband said, why are you in such a hurry? She said, it is well. Why? Because his faith was not there to believe God for a miracle. So she's not going to tell him something only to have him destroy her faith. Listen, you don't go around telling everything to everybody. Yeah? Oh, you know what? You know what? God said this to me. Sure not. People like you, sure not. God told me this year my business is going to break through. Sure no, this economy very bad, you know. <laughs> She's not going to do that. She's not going to tell the husband, I'm going to look for the pastor so that we can pray for a miracle because the husband is not there to accept it. So she said, all is well. Friends, they are dream thieves and they are also faith destroyers. So surround yourself with people of like precious faith. Amen. Now, look at verse 24. Then she saddled a donkey and said to the servant, Drive and go forward and do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. In other words, put the paddle on the metal. Rush! Let's go right now. Look at verse 25. So she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off. He said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shulamite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Now, look, this is the perfect time for her to break down and cry because she's in front of a pastor. She just lost a boy. The boy died. This is the perfect time for her to go, Oh, what a mean how cool. No, nothing is well. My life is in a mess. <laughs> Why bad things are happening to me? Ever since I trusted God, I never have one good day. <laughs> this is a perfect time. This is a perfect time for her just to break down and to let it all out. Right? Correct. Now, there is this pressure. That will come upon you at the moment of your breakthrough there will be that pressure at the moment for you to turn the corner the pressure will come what will you say what will you declare as your destiny this woman refused to speak death she chose to speak life she refused to doubt and consider the negative and look at the darkness so she answered it is well. Can you imagine how hard it is for a mother who had a miracle boy and the boy just died and said, look, everything is fine. Wow. Wow. It is well. Now, God and Elisha could see that her soul was in deep distress. So they asked him, they asked her, what happened? And she said, she said, my boy died. My boy died. God did a miracle, but, she, but he died. But her, his, her first response was, everything is okay. I need a miracle from God, but everything is fine. And because of her believing and her speaking, of her faith, God raised her son from the dead. Oh, come on, let's give God a big hand right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Oh, go ahead and praise God. Hallelujah. After all, this is a boy of destiny. If he had not been raised from the dead, there would be no book of Habakkuk. No matter what you're going through today, don't doubt. Don't consider narrative. Be honest, but don't doubt. Be realistic, but don't consider the negative. Don't keep talking about the darkness. Just command the light to come. Speak the word of God into your situation. God is not going to let you down. Jesus tells us that. Your mountain will be removed. It will be cast into the sea. How many of you this morning want to believe God? And how many of you want a miracle from God in your life this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of you want to be stronger in your faith? Put up your hands. Yeah. How many of you this morning, as, as we go through all the scriptures and the Holy Spirit is saying to you, and you say, God, I want to be more, I want to be a person of faith. I want to, no, I, I don't want to doubt. How many of you decide today, you're not going to be a doubter? You're not going to consider negative all the time. Your first response will always be, I trust the word of God. How many of you want to do that today? Can we just, why don't we just pray in tongues? Don't have to stand up. Just stay where you are because there are a few things we want to do right now. Let's just begin to speak in tongues wherever you are. Come on, from the front to the back. Come on, from the I want to sing as a musician to come up right now. Let's just pray for another 30 more seconds. Hallelujah. Everybody just. Close your eyes and say this right now. Let's come before God, right? In repentance for every negative word that we have spoken. Everybody say, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus Once again, I cancel every negative word again, that I have spoken over my life. Over my life. Every word that I have released every word that, I release. that is against your word, that is against your, word. That is against your will and your plan, I ask you to forgive me right now. Forgive me for focusing on the negative. I cancel in Jesus' name all the negative words. We just pray to God right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Forgiveness in the blood. Forgiveness in the blood. Superior blood of Jesus. Cleanse our mouth. Cleanse our tongue. We cancel every curse in the name of Jesus. Every curse of failure, every curse of poverty, every curse of sickness, every curse of early death, we cancel it right now by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Keep on praying, just pray a little bit more. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you believe God heard your prayers, give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Last Monday, on February 20th, one of our members, Anya Liao, just got a new baby. The first baby in, in, in their marriage, in her marriage. Now, what you do not know is this. Anya and Manny have been trying to have a baby ever since they got married. But both of them have reproduction challenges not just one but both of them in fact the doctor came back with a very very discouraging report they only have one percent chance of ever conceiving one percent chance in fact Anya said that it was so discouraging every time going to see the gynecologist and and it's so discouraging because you know and the doctor obviously did not believe it's gonna happen she decided I think I'm going to stop going. Just too discouraging. She refused to focus on the negative, but she said, God, I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to believe you for a miracle. God, give me a miracle. God, give me a miracle. Last year, Anya was in SOT. So when she was in a, a time of prayer and worship, and all of a sudden, God gave her a vision. She saw a happy baby boy running all around the house. And immediately, she knew God is going to give her a son. So last year, we had this marketplace fellowship in, in, along Shenton Way, and she was there. 
and we are preaching about speaking to the mountain speaking to the mountain like what I've been sharing today Anya decided to confess every single day she began to speak I command this barrenness to go I speak to this thorality leave my husband and I we are gonna have a happy boy that's gonna run all over the house and she just kept confessing it and kept leaving two weeks after the marketplace meeting she found she was pregnant and last Monday she gave birth to a healthy baby come on let's give God a big clap one percent chance one percent chance listen listen can you imagine you go you go to see the doctor the gynecologist and we thank God for all the wonderful doctors in our midst and we have faith-filled doctors faith-filled doctors in City Harvest but she went to see this doctor and this doctor looked at her one percent chance one percent chance I tell you something one percent to the world is 100 percent to God one percent to the world is 100 percent to the Word of God come on you believe that give the Lord a big clap so I was preparing praying in the midst of my fasting and prayer and then I felt the Holy Spirit inspired me to to get you to, to, to get you step out in faith so I especially get an office this week to come up with this card called my confession I want to ask just quickly just pass it out to everybody right now you know I should just pass it out and if you turn to the flip side there are areas I want you to confess I want you to confess all right just pass it out if, how many of you do not have one just put up your hands so you don't have yeah just put up your hands if you need to have a pen or a pencil we only have limited one just put up your hands and they'll give it to you if not you could share I want everybody just take yesterday there was one young girl I think Naomi was here and she's like what 10 years old and she she also wrote in I was really impressed <laughs> so I want you to take this out and I want you to fill up this card those of you watching on the internet you can download this it's there on the screen as well in Jesus name I command my mountain and what is that mountain command it to be removed and cast into the sea and then there are five areas I visualize believe and confess about your health you know and I put a scripture for you God will restore your health and heal you of your wounds what do you want to confess about your work God is going to be magnified because he has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant God wants to prosper you in your work what do you believe and confess about your home and your family the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts so peace must flow like a river right confess it now what do you confess about City Harvest Church Jesus says I will build my church and he's still building it sure this is a challenging time but Jesus is the head of this church what do you believe about your cell group about this church just write it down what about your future your destiny I love Philippians 1 6 being confident of this very thing he who had begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ being confident of this very thing this one thing you don't have to be confident of many things just this one thing God who is the author of your life he started writing he's gonna finish it strong you can have a victorious end 